in the chat and at the tables. A uh, reminder, if you want to ask questions of this next fantastic panel, put them in the Q&A. That's where all your questions go. You can also meet new folks in the chat function. We want you to share contact information and meet new people for legislative session. Speaking of legislative session, we know that housing, once again, is going to be one of the top issues this legislative session that will be discussed. And we're going to need every single one of you to make your voices heard on this issue so that we can get even more done this session, hopefully. So even if it's just that we got to hold the governor accountable so that his rich friends aren't getting special breaks on housing, we're going to do that. So we need each one of you to sign up with these amazing organizations who are here today to talk to you about housing justice. This panel is called Turning a Housing Crisis into Housing Justice. And it's going to be led by my dear friend and colleague, Will Pregman, who is our communications director. Will, take it away. Thank you so much, Annette. Uh, and thank you for that introduction. Again, my name is Will Pregman. I'm the communications director here at Battleborn Progress. I am really excited to be hosting this panel because I think far and away what we and many other organizations we're doing a lot of work during this past election cycle and the one before that have heard is that housing and the skyrocketing cost of housing continues to be among the top issues, if not the top issues, for a lot of voters out there from all political sides of the political spectrum. And with me today are a few guests who are committed to that fight, who are going to be doing a ton of work. Uh, have been doing a ton of work and will continue to do so during the legislative session. And I'm really excited to first introduce Ben Ines with the Nevada Housing Justice Coalition. Uh, ben is working with a variety of different groups to push this issue forward and make sure that we are uh, positioning Nevada in a way that is more orientated towards housing justice rather than giving more credence and uh, benefits to, as Annette mentioned, the uh, Robert Bigelow's of the world, who, if you don't know, spent uh, something in the tune of uh, eight to nine figures on the governor's race here. And uh, if you think that's a problem, this panel's for you, because we're going to be talking about how to uh, turn, as we said, that housing crisis into housing justice. So, uh, Ben, Please introduce yourself and tell us about the NHJC Coalition. Absolutely. Thank you, Will. Uh, thank you for having me. So my name is Ben Innes, and I'm the Coalition Coordinator for the Nevada Housing Justice Alliance, otherwise known as the NHJA. And we are a coalition of grassroots organizers and community advocates who work directly with Nevada tenants to develop solutions and advocate for community investments that solve the root causes of housing insecurity. Um, a little more context just some of our highest values that guide all of our work and be guiding and leading our work this legislative session we believe housing is a human right not a commodity and it, that home serves a higher purpose than just shelter uh, we aim and center the needs and experiences of directly impacted nevadans again uh, tenant we are you know tenant-led and tenant-driven uh, coalition in our work and we believe that we can address the root causes of housing insecurity through organized action and the building of tenant power which is why we're here to talk uh, today um, I'm here joined by many of my fabulous, wonderful peers um, in the coalition. Um, I'm going to briefly just name them, introduce them, um, but we'll start uh, one topic uh, at a time, just so we're conscious of the limit time we have. Um, so first, uh, I'm joined by Jonathan Norman, who's the Advocacy, Outreach, and Policy Director at the Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers. Uh, Lily Barrett, Policy Manager for the ACLU of Nevada. Melanie Arismendi, who is a culinary union uh, and organizer and member. Katrina Gigsby Thetford, who is the executive director for the Nevada Homeless Alliance. Uh, and that's everyone. Uh, so to begin, uh, we're going to start with Jonathan, if you're, you're ready to join me, Jonathan. And uh, I think it's very important for us to start off uh, in this overview of the kind of housing uh, injustice and, and legislative landscape we're in. Uh, you can define summary evictions for us, um, and I'll have some follow-up questions from there. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Uh, my name is Jonathan Norman, and so the Coalition of Legal Service Providers includes Legal Aid Center in the South and the Senior Law Program, uh, the Volunteer Attorneys of Rural Nevada, and the Northern Nevada Legal Aid. Um, you know, when I think about housing, I, 
you know, just recently, is it still a crisis? Rent just fell by 0.3%, right? After going up by more than 20% with a lot of fixed income seniors and people with disabilities totally priced out of, of, of housing. Um, what makes Nevada unique is definitely summary eviction. So uh, I'm just gonna walk you through how that works in a, in a typical context. And I would say, you know, probably 98% of the evictions in Nevada are summary evictions and how they function. And, and, and typically most of those are gonna be um, non-payment of rent. So there's a variety of notices that can go out in landlord tenant um, context, but the seven day notice to pay or quit is the most common. And so when you get that notice, it's, it's posted on your door, you have three options. You can catch up your rent if you're able, you can leave the property, which is an informal or a self eviction, or you can file a, a tenant affidavit, which is an answer. And that's a, a pleading filed with the court. So there is no other jurisdiction in the country that I'm aware of where the first thing filed in a landlord tenant case is the responsive pleading from the tenant without a complaint being filed. So in virtually every other um, type of litigation from landlord tenant to you know, high dollar commercial litigation, the complaint is the first pleading filed with the court, not an answer. Um, but here we, we have that, that process reversed. And literally I, I was practicing in New Mexico before I moved to Nevada. And when I got here and an, an attorney who practices in landlord tenant explained the, the, the procedure here, I said, I said, surely that can't be right. I went back to my office and I looked it up and I was like, well, that is that is sure, surely right. And so it just creates a lot of, one, there's confusion if you move from out of state anywhere else in the country where you, you're used to an ordinary procedure, you don't take those notices seriously. Um, and then in addition, you know, landlords use those notices in a lot of contexts as, as a, a way to engage the tenant to, to start having a payment plan or something. So there are tenants who receive that notice every month. And so, you know, one, you don't know if it's real. It's not from a court. It's not stamped. So I think it creates a, a lot of confusion. And so what we'd like to see is for uh, Nevada to track the rest of the country. And, you know, when I say we don't want to get in line with California, we want to get in line with Oklahoma and Mississippi. In, in like, you know, their progressive housing policies, which are having the landlord file that, that complaint first. So we'd like to see the order switch. So the notice period goes out. At the end of the notice period, the landlord files a complaint, serves it on the tenant. The tenant has a period of time to respond. Um, and you know, what that period of time it ranges um, around the country, some are five days, some are 10 days. Um, so that's the, the change we're, we're looking to make. We have, um, a BDR for that, and we'll be supporting that in the session. Ben, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I was going to quickly butt in and ask is, um, you know, in terms of the opposition and what we're up against, uh, how do we, you know, what are some of the narratives of why uh, that it does exist and why it still persists today? Like, why is it justified in terms of? Yeah, I think it's, um, I, you know, I don't know that landlords that they exactly justify it. They say, the burden on mom and pop landlords is 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 too much, and I, I would say to that, you know, rising rents, um, it's being driven by out of state landlords, and and I would also just say like, you know, every state in the country has mom and pop landlords, right? It's not like they only exist in Nevada, and somehow they're they're making it work in all the states where they have to file a complaint. So the idea that that those mom and pop landlords are are suffering, you know, that couldn't couldn't file a complaint first, I think is just just erroneous. And then, and I think generally, you know, um, I think at the beginning of last year, there was a pamphlet sent out called Raise the Roof, which said no rent caps in Nevada, which pointed out you can raise the rent as much as you want. If you have a fixed income senior, um, you know, you can raise it and then evict them and get somebody in there who can pay more. And I think that's the the attitude of a, of a lot of um, you know, big, big apartment complexes and out of state landlords. So I think, you know, the mom and pop narrative, the, whether it's the apartment association or the realtors, they want to blanket the entire industry as mom and pop. When, as Will said, we've got Mr. Bigelow, um, we've got the Seagulls who, you know, there was a, a house report um, labeling them uniquely egregious. And, and so we have to deal with that whole industry, not just this, this phantom mom and pop who, who must run everything. 
Yeah, thank you, Jonathan, for, for mentioning that memo. I know for those of us that have read it or seen it or heard about it, uh, it's pretty harrowing to see just that uh, very bold, uh, direct language um, that's you know ultimately pretty, pretty uh, heartless um, and just aims to exploit our community that's already um, impacted and suffering. Um, before I transition, Jonathan, I think we still have a few moments together. Um, can you talk about what legislation um, to you know, erase or remove some eviction um, from the statutes has looked like up to now. Yeah, so up till now in Nevada, it's been unsuccessful having legislation to change summary eviction. And there's there have been movements to eliminate summary eviction. Um, I, I think I would rather reform it than remove it, primarily because summary eviction does not carry money damages, right? So there are there's a clear advantage to tenants and to landlords in, in the process we're suggesting um, is still advantageous to landlords because it's slower than a formal eviction. In a formal eviction, you would have a, you know, you'd have a period of discovery, and it's it more mirrors general civil litigation. So I think, um, you know, summary eviction has an advantage for tenants, and it's, it's primarily that it is just about the possession of the property and does not include money damages, um, and that's that's pretty powerful um, for people. Gotcha. Thank you, John. For clarifying that part. Um, I was going to speak on that. Uh, it's hard that we have such short time with all of our guests. And I definitely think we could spend the hour, and if not more, the entire day talking about uh, the urgency of uh, urgency, uh, fixing you know, uh, some eviction and the impact it has. Uh, but I will move forward now uh, as we'll tie that back into the rest of our conversation uh, to Lily. Again, uh, Lily Barron, Policy Manager for the ACLU of Nevada. Um, talk about you know we start talking about the opposition you know which is very kind of broad vague term um help us know and understand um what we need to know in terms of identifying our who are friends and who are opponents uh, in this legislative session and this uh housing landscape sure Ben. thanks for having me um so yeah it's last session we saw um some of the narratives one of my favorites was this mom and pop landlord um, and that was that wasn't one person who owns you know a townhome that's not who they were talking about we're talking about people who still own 100 plus units <clears throat> so we saw a lot of mom and pop landlords calling in saying you know we'll be we'll be pushed out of house and home if we lower the rent or if we allow um, any kind of caps or tenant protections of any kind um, which is simply just not true. I'm not to mention, you know, a decade ago, not even a decade ago, the thought of being a landlord was supposed to be passive income. Um, it was never supposed to be someone's primary job to have housing uh, that they're basically hoarding from other people. Being a landlord is not a job, it's an investment. So when prices go up, for them, that's their responsibility. You know, if you were a stock or something like that, we wouldn't be lobbying people with less money to pay the difference because these people made an unsound investment. And that's kind of what's happening right now. So we saw the mom and pop landlords, and we saw the uh, like the contractors, the realtors, the apartments association, uh, property management folks, because essentially, all of them are paid by the overcharging of rent. You know, we're not paying someone's mortgage, we're paying three times someone's mortgage now. It's, it's much more than that. So that's kind of what we're seeing. Um, one of the one of the big things people need to look out for are these um, arguments. <laughs> these arguments that she's very passionate about housing also, um, where they're asking the tenant to solve the problem. We see it a lot. You know, um, the ownership class will create a problem, then they'll create a solution that we have to still buy to solve. And that's not how we solve solutions. That's how we make people know dive deeper into poverty, which is what some of these solutions that they're proposing are. One of them is called lease assurance. So that's going to ask the tenant who may have, a, they might have an eviction on their record, or they might have, you know, a lower credit score. Or the landlord just doesn't like something about their application uh, without without some of these other bills passing like source of income discrimination we won't be able to um, landlords will still be able to discriminate on the source that your income comes from if they just don't like it they don't have to accept your application so lease assurance would 
make the tenant pay a little more of a deposit uh, on top of what they would already pay so that the landlord is more comfortable uh, accepting this application. Now, the issue with that is that people don't have more. They didn't have more last session and they certainly don't this session. We were hearing people call in and saying, I am living in my garage, I'm living in my storage unit, I have four kids in my car. Imagine asking someone who's just been living with four kids in their car for the last uh, year to pay just a little bit more to get into a home, which is not, it's not possible. When these folks are seeing, you know, skyrocketing profits because of things like raising the roof and sending out these things. The only people who have lost money during the housing crisis are tenants, not contractors, not real estate, realtors or apartment association people. And it's really important to be keen on the language that they use because they'll try to use language like mom and pop to, to lessen the, um, the severity of what they're talking about. Uh, so I think it's going to be really important that people are discerning about that, that they're following everyone on social, like, I you know, ACLU, Battleborn, Plan, um, we are all going to be, you know, NHJA is going to be trying to keep people informed as rapidly as quick as possible to call in um, when, when we see these bills that we should be imposing that are going to hurt Nevadans um, coming through, like, like they do, you know, so we had, uh, there was a bill last session that required a small, well, the summary eviction bill, actually, we can talk about. Um, the, the amount of, of um, housing folks, bad actors, who are now in that you know, housing coalition who called in, it was like hundreds, hundreds of contractors and people saying, you know, this will, this will greatly economically disadvantage me. What that means is they can't take like their fifth vacation to Maui this year, you know? It's like their economic disadvantagement is, it's not the same as I'm going to live in my car if I have to pay into another fund to secure income that I barely have for rent that's highest growing in the country. Thank you, Luke. Uh, I want to, with the time we have still, I want to bridge some of the ideas um, that you mentioned. So if lease assurance, lease assurance is something that is so awful as uh, disproportionate to burden to uh, you know, low income and struggling tenants in our state that are already struggling and who have to pay more. What kind of groups or what kind of people are trying to put this, put that idea forward or maybe other like false policy solutions under the guise of, you know, equity or progress? Yeah, so um, the lease assurance thing started in Oregon and it didn't pass in Oregon. Um, and the housing coalition, um, the Nevada Housing Coalition, which does have, you know, folks on both sides. I know that some of our orgs are a part of the Nevada Housing Coalition so that we can see what's going on and keep an eye on everything because there are some things that we do have to work on together. Um, but they are the ones who are really pushing this lease assurance thing and it wasn't successful there, you know? So they're kind of, they're saying everything but that when they're telling folks, but they are shopping this very, very hard. There has not been a singular housing meeting that I've been in that someone has not mentioned lease assurance. They're trying to really make it so that this is this is the solution. This this is not at all the solution. We will see more people that are more dependent on um, on alternate sources of getting their rent, which you know we have to talk about. Like that affects public safety, and we don't really think about it as much when we we force people into these positions where their job and assistance and borrowing money from their friends and the credit card isn't paying even the rent, we're resorting to different activities to, in order to feed our families, you know, and that, that is an issue of public safety. And of overall, just help the health of our community. You know, we have people that are going to work sick because they can't stay home. You know, we have people that are uh, leaving their kids in their car because they don't have a, appropriate childcare. You know, these are really, really serious consequences to something that, um, that is uh, the solution, like a solution like lease assurance being being uh, put forward when the consequences are so high is just disingenuous. And it's uh, it's shameful really because there are other there are other solutions that we all know that there are. Yeah, they can really agree. Um, it's hard when groups with take their kind of uh, stature um, and try to present solutions that do more harm than good. Um, 
and then you know present themselves as serving the community serving the community um, when in fact they serve developers and other moneyed interests um really thank you for your time no uh, i'd love to say really quickly if they, if they were serving the community they would be the community and they're not none of these people are tenants and that's the number one way you can find out if you're getting in the housing debate my favorite thing is to ask when was the last time you paid rent yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. Um, onward now uh, to Melanie Arzmendi, uh, who I mentioned before, culinary union member and organizer. Um, I'd like to welcome you to join us now um, and talk to us about the neighborhood stability campaign that took place in Las Vegas or Northern Las Vegas. Uh, hello, my name is Melanie Arismendi. I'm a 22 year old college student and a Nova Vegas resident. Uh, my mom, she's a culinary union member. She works at Sears Palace Clean Rooms as a guest room attendant. Uh, the neighborhood stability campaign started as an effort to get a ballot initiative in Nova Vegas to tie rent increases to inflation. But this isn't a problem, but this is a problem everywhere, not just in Nova Vegas, right? Uh, in some areas, rents have gone up 25% in the last year. In the last year, more than 21,000 people uh, signed up to support neighborhood stability across the state. The housing crisis is an urgent issue that is affecting our working class families. We need to put a stop to rising rents now. Thank you, Melly. I think that's a great introduction. Um, so broadly, I mean, what what would the what was the neighborhood stability program campaign? Uh, what would it have accomplished or achieved? Uh, we want to uh, stabilize rent so that people can afford housing, right? So they have affordable housing. So families aren't forced to move out of their homes and choose between uh, paying for food or rent. It's a hard decision. Yeah, absolutely. When folks, you know, are paying a third or even as up to as much up to you know half or more of their income uh, on rents, that yeah, that impacts and takes away from every part of life, whether food, transit, you know, health and medicine. Uh, and so on. Um, I know you mentioned you said your mother works at Caesars. So you said, um, can you say more on how uh, your story of how you got involved? Uh, yeah, uh, I got involved because when I was growing up, uh, my family we had to move around a lot. Well, the main reason we had to move around a lot was because of the unaffordable price of housing. It was uh, really tough for my family. Uh, and it makes me really emotional to think about how many times we had to move because every time we had to move, you know, I had to leave my friends behind, I had to navigate a new school and make all new friends again, right? And we had to move um, from California to Nevada to Texas just in the first four years of my life. And uh, it wasn't until 2004 that uh, we bought a house and it was a five bedroom home where we weren't super able to have our own bedrooms, but, you know, we had to we lost our home in the Great Recession. I was um, when I was just eight years old in 2008, and it was really tough. And uh, I know that a lot of people are going through that. And to just imagine all the kids, you know, just like when I was young, I had to leave all my toys behind. I had to move in with uh, my uncle in California. We all moved into one bedroom, and uh, we just had to leave a lot of things behind. It was it was hard, and my parents had to make a lot of sacrifices, you know, so we could have a better life. And even in uh, 2012, when we moved back to Vegas, you know, um, it was, we were able to move back to Vegas in 2012 and uh, it changed for the better because, you know, I was able to get a union job as, like I said, a guest room attendant where she, she's clean rooms just palace and has really good benefits. You know, like she has insurance for all of us and eventually she was able to uh, save money and buy her home now that I'm living in right now. Uh, it was before the pandemic that I was able to move out uh, with my boyfriend right in like 2019 and I was uh, going to CSN uh, to get my associate's degree. I was paying uh, $1,800 for a three bedroom apartment, which wasn't too bad because right now it's just ridiculous. Uh, and I had two other roommates there to be able to afford it. <clears throat> and, uh, but it wasn't until the pandemic hit that I had to move out. I had to, they had to move back with the parents. And then I had to move back to with my parents to the home in Nova Vegas. And uh, it's just, uh, I just hope one day I can graduate from high school, from college and I can uh, 
move out of my parents' house, find an affordable apartment, and become a homeowner, homeowner just like my mom did, right? But right now, it's just so expensive. Rent is so expensive, and it's something that we have to think. Absolutely. Thank you, Billy. Thank you for sharing your, st your story with us uh, and some of those you know, difficult uh, you know, details and memories. Um, I think your story really shows how uh, you know, in our culture, in our society, uh, viewing housing as an investment, as a product, and not something that is uh, you know, supplied and guaranteed first, you know, you know, to build a flourishing life from, uh, and that just reinforces this sink or swim kind of uh, kind of narrative where either you, uh, yeah, get by or you don't. Um, a follow-up question to that is, um, you know, with, with your experience in the housing stability campaign. Um, how is it? How have you seen it as an example of a, a tenant-forward approach to housing justice? You know, with Lily just now, we we're talking about um, folks. Uh, you know, don't engage with tenants; they work with developers and with landlords. Um, so, how is the housing stability campaign, uh, you know, tenant-led and tenant-driven? Uh, well, many culinary union members are tenants, right? And they found that this was a major issue, and they wanted to fight against rising rents. That's what the neighbor stability was. A lot of people that came out to help uh, the tenants, they circulated and they signed a petition. Uh, many of my coworkers I know of the, on the campaign received enormous rent increases. And they, all, there were some that also got ev evicted during the campaign. It was really, really bad. What are, um, I know, you know, with some narrow, actually, let's say, some narrow timelines, and I think some like, you know, deep frustrations in the community and with the campaign um, that limited the uh, kind of signing off for approval. Uh, what are the next steps for the housing stability campaign? Well, we want to take uh, neighborhood stability to the state legislator and keep fighting until we get it done. Uh, I want to show these big corporations that they can't keep raising rents and forcing people out of their homes. Absolutely. Uh, we look forward to seeing you, having you up in Carson with all of us. Uh, so I think final question for you is, uh, how can people get involved uh, in supporting this campaign and your work? Uh, well, you can sign up on uh, our website for Neighbor Stability. It's uh, neighborhoodstability.org. And you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook, the Culinary Union, and Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Melly. And we'll be sure to um, load those same channels uh, at the end of this panel. Uh, yeah, I appreciate your time and your work so much. Thank you. Uh, moving to our next panelist, uh, Katrina Grigsby Thetford, Executive Director for the Nevada Homeless Alliance. Uh, uh, we'd love to ask you and talk about, uh, well, first, you know, who you are and the work you do. I have been neglecting that question for everyone. Um, but primarily focus on source of income discrimination. Uh, what it is, what it's like, how it harms folks, and how can we address it in the legislature? Absolutely. So greetings, everyone. Um, my name is Katrina grigsby Depper. I'm the executive director of Nevada Homeless Alliance. Um, I'm a person with lived experience of ex uh, literal homelessness. Um, stand on the streets, abandoned buildings, in cars that wasn't even mine. <laughs> From 2000 to 2009, I have multiple instances of legal involvement um, in my history, and I'm a person in long-term recovery from substance abuse. Um, as I mentioned, I am the director of Nevada Homeless Alliance, and at Nevada Homeless Alliance, we bring people together to advance solutions to homelessness, and we do this by partnering closely with federal state and local government, business, civic, and faith-based organizations and people who are currently homeless or who have been in the past. We also believe that housing is a human right and our mission is to advance collaborative strategies to end homelessness in Southern Nevada through advocacy, public awareness, education, and coordination of services. My personal mantra is that I will say from homelessness to serve the homeless. So I'm going to start by stating that homelessness is a housing issue. It's not a personal issue. It is primarily a housing issue. This is a systems 
problem and it requires a systems response. So regardless how you look at it, most folks are homeless because of lack of affordable housing. Barriers to obtaining housing, maybe that's low income, criminal history, credit scores, and of course, other discriminatory practices. That's the first thing. Um, so there are actually individuals right now in programs where an agency will be paying their rent and they still can't locate, obtain housing. So this is a problem problem in our community. I can go on and on, but today we're gonna focus just on the source of income discrimination. So first, what is source of income discrimination? It is the practice of refusing to rent to a housing applicant because of that person's lawful form of income. So the definition of source of income itself is any lawful verifiable source of income or housing assistance paid to or on behalf of a renter or buyer, including but not limited to monies from legal occupation, occupation or activity any contract, agreement, loan, or settlement from any court order payments such as child support or from federal, state, local payments, including disability benefits, housing choice vouchers, or any rent subsidy or rental assistance programs. Those are definitions of uh, sources of income. And there's no protections in Nevada to, um, to stop landlords from denying individuals due to their source of income. And when they deny, a landlord denies an individual due to their source of income, that is discrimination. So Nevada law allows individuals to be denied housing based on the following sources of legal income. Housing choice vouchers or Section 8 vouchers. HUD VASH um, vouchers, these are Section 8 vouchers for veterans. People with disability uh, who are relying on Social Security or veteran dis disability payments individuals who get unemployment co compensation, individuals who get child support, alimony, TANF, or other benefits, families and individuals exiting homelessness through housing assistance program, such as rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing, and students receiving financial aid or educational loans. So there's been a couple past uh, attempts at reform. Um, AB 317 was introduced in 2021. It would have added source of income as the protected class in Nevada's fair housing law. It would not have applied to mom and pop landlords who have more than two properties, and it would not have prohibited housing providers from settling reasonable and non-discriminatory financial and credit applications on applicants. Um, and also during COVID-19, Clark County um, put out an emergency ordinance that was tied to COVID-19, of course, and it applied only in un unincorporated Park County. It was enforced by the Business License Department, and it didn't apply to owner-occupied dwellings, group homes, special care facilities, or religious organizations. So, you know, we did this during the COVID-19 state of emergency. There was a source of income ordinance. You couldn't discriminate and deny people housing if they had certain sources of income. Um, just across the United States, there are 17 states in the District of Columbia who have written source of income um, laws into their fair housing as a protected class, right? And source of income protections in these states have seen a higher prevalence of families permanently moving out of homelessness. Um, and why is this so important, right? So under current law, Nevada law, renters who are relying on housing choice vouchers, rental assistance, all those other things I mentioned earlier, may currently be denied housing based on their legal source of income. So adding source of income as a protected class in Nevada fair housing law will protect vulnerable populations from housing instability, instability and homelessness by removing discriminatory barriers to housing. Homeless services organizations spend a lot of time and resources finding landlords willing to partner and provide leases to people benefiting from rental assistance and who may have legal sources of income other than employment, such as, like I mentioned early, disability, child support, unemployment. So, source of income and legal, source of income discrimination 
and difficulty with finding cooperative landlords often extends the length of time that family individuals experience homelessness. So what can we do about it? Contact your legislators and ask them to support passing legislation to stop source of income discrimination. Tell them why this is important for you and our community. And if you have a personal story of being denied housing due to your source of income, please, please share that. Um, for more information, you can visit our website at www.nevadahomelessalliance.org. You can follow us on Twitter at NHA Voice, Voice NHA Voice, or visit our Facebook page, Nevada Homeless Alliance. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, first, for your work and for your uh, very detailed explanation. Uh, definitely you know paints a kind of grim reality of things as they are which shows it's expensive to be poor um, and how you know just as backwards as some eviction process that uh, up to now they have been you know institutionally codified and, and protected uh, and so you know as we enter the session here's to um, you know all being you know, leaving today galvanized uh, in order to uh, push those tenant protections forward uh, thank you again uh, and now I think our, the formal panel is concluded and we're going to move towards some rapid fire Q&A with the time that we have left. And I'll pass it back to Will. Yes, thank you so much, Ben. And thank you so much, uh, Jonathan, Lily, Katrina, and Melanie for giving us insight into the housing crisis issue and what's being done on the ground to move the housing justice cause forward. And getting some really excellent questions from the chat. I'm really excited to dive into some of these. I'm going to start off with a uh, question from Woody. Uh, he asks, there have been talk about communities building tiny houses for the elderly, low income, and uh, unhoused population. Can you explain uh, the view of some tiny houses? Um, can you explain the view that some tiny houses are just a modern tent city? I guess uh, what we're getting at here is uh, this, these projects to build tiny homes. What is that? Uh, is that presenting a, a solution here? Um, and are there obstacles that are that are preventing that from really being transformative for for those populations? Um, is that something Lily you want to tackle? Gosh, yes, I would love to. Um, so, so there's two like there's two things about this, and I kind of mentioned it earlier. Like, they will create a problem and then sell you the solution. There are over a hundred homes for every homeless person in this country. Like, I will never stop saying that. It's just it's not the kind of homes they think we deserve, right? Why do? Why is it that the working class has to have a tiny home? Why can't they just have a home? You know. So, like, yes, this is a. a it is better if you're outside living outside it would be better to have a tiny home but boy i've seen them be able to build luxury apartments very quickly much faster than the little tiny home villages as well so what are we really talking about you know some of these tiny homes are poor quality who's going to pay for those repairs who's paying for the land um some of them don't have kitchens now somebody's not even able to be sustainable one of the, like, the most sacred things to me as an autonomous adult is that I can make my own food if I want to. Now we're asking someone to live in a home where they're not even able to make their own meals or have a community. There's a lot of rules, like a lot of barriers that go around those. A lot of them are you have to be sober. A lot of them are you, you can't have a pet or you can't have anyone over. You have a curfew. And all of a sudden it's like we've got this paternalistic um, approach to just people being housed. So sure, we could build some tiny homes, or we could just stop letting people profit off of building luxury apartments and stop and start prioritizing the housing that everybody deserves. Uh, where I would, you know, so no, boo, tiny homes. <laughs> That's an excellent perspective. Thank you for that, Lily. I have another question here uh, from Amber in our chat. Amber asks, is it possible to limit the number of homes a private investment company can purchase in a given neighborhood? Um, this sounds maybe like uh, one perhaps for Jonathan. Would you like to take a stab at that one? Yeah, I think right now there is there is no limit. I, and I'm not aware of any BDR to address that and what if any constitutional issues, if there are any that would be raised by treating that differently. I certainly think one of the 
you know, the biggest and most damaging things to our community is, is out of state landlords taking large amounts of the single family homes out of our housing stock. And, you know, I think we have to be open to exploring that, but I'm just not aware of, of the feasibility of that. And then I just want to comment on the tiny homes. We also need to distinguish between a tiny home, which is a very bougie thing, right? Like people are paying hundred thousand dollars for those in a repurposed shed. And I think that when a lot of people are talking about um, building tiny homes for the unhoused, they're talking about a shed that is that is built for garden tools that you buy at Lowe's or Home Depot. And I just I agree with Lily that that's not um, a solution uh, that that affords people a dignity. Yes, uh, that's definitely true. It's definitely kind of a hipster trend a little bit. Um, and while it could be well intentioned, there's there's still some problems there. Um, Laura, or our good friend Laura Martin, asks in the chat, and um, I'm very curious to hear y'all's perspective on this. Why did uh, Speaker Yeager, that's Steve Yeager, the Speaker of the Assembly, um, for those who don't know, uh, in the audience, overlook three incumbent women of color who had strong tenant bills for committee leadership positions. Um, who would like to take a stab at this one? Katrina, is this one for you? No. <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, Laura, for that question. <laughs> Uh, I think that um, this, you know, this goes to like campaign finance reform, right? Um, those three women were also the only ones who did not receive uh, campaign contributions from the Realtors Association. So unfortunately in Nevada, because we do not have um, any regulations around who can um, donate and what that looks like, and because we have a part-time legislature often, um, politicians are they're not forced to they don't have to but they feel as if they're forced to um, side with the people who give them the most money so that they can get reelected um, and so that is why a lot of uh, our politicians whether you know we can tell them the saddest stories ever uh, they're not gonna they're worried that their reelection is at stake um, one solution to that that I've heard is that when you know, when these, when those three women, and I'm going to shout them out because I want everybody to get them, give them a dollar if you have one. Um, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong, Assemblywoman um, Cecilia Gonzalez, and Assemblywoman Claire Thomas, I believe that's who she's talking about. Um, those are our heroes. Those are our champions. Those are the people we need to be knocking doors for. Those are the people that we need to show. Sure, you didn't get $20,000 from the Realtors Association. The 20000 of us gave you a dollar because we believe in you and we trust you and we are your constituents who, you know, we can do that also. We've seen it happen in larger federal um, federal runs, like uh, like the Bernie Sanders campaign is a good example where he did a lot of a lot of donations that he got were under twenty thousand dollars or under twenty dollars inside, where a lot of people's donations are more in the thousands. So that is why and the solution we need to do when we see people deviating from um, from the norm and they're really taking a stand on us that or for us those are super brave women for doing that we need to support them and show them that we're here for them because they're uh, definitely people are definitely punished for standing up for us very very wise words and we are coming up on our time limit unfortunately there's so many excellent questions in the chat i want to give each of you just like literally 10 seconds to tell us how do we get in touch with you to ask these questions and more and how to get involved for the upcoming legislative session so i'm going to start with ben go thank you all uh our twitter hashtag is the or at the NHJA. My email is ben at nbhousingjustice.org. Uh, please get in contact if this, you know, if this issue impacts you, if you want to join the fight, if you want to support us, if you want to support the other members on this call, um, let us know. Uh, we will have lobby days at the legislature, uh, town halls, a tenant convening in Northern Nevada, and so on, um, as the fight ends for the next 120 days, uh, but also the years beyond. Um, so yeah, please uh, reach out to us. Jonathan. Yeah, thanks, Will. So 
for better or worse, I put my personal cell phone on my business card. So if you get my business card, 702-575-5505. You can text me, call me. Um, and then my Twitter handle is at jnorman, and then zero. Fantastic. Lily. Um, you can follow ACLU of Nevada, and um, I guess you can have my, you know, my personal phone number. It's everywhere. You'll find it. Um, and on, on Twitter, it's um, at Lilith, L-I-L-I-T-H, Baron, B-A-R-A-N. Excellent. Melanie. Uh, you can go on to the neighborstability.org website, where you can follow the culinary on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Thank you. Thank you. And last but not least, Katrina. You can visit our website at www.nevadahomeofalliance.org. Twitter is at NHA Voice, that's V O I C E. Facebook, the Nevada Homeless Alliance. And when you visit our website, you can click on our policy uh, council link and sign up for advocacy alerts. Fantastic. Thank you so much, all of you. We are going to kick it back to Annette because we have more Progressive Summit coming right up. Annette, take it away. Thank you, Will. And thank you, Ben, and this entire fabulous panel. Um, you all are a wealth of knowledge, and I appreciate every single one of you. Uh, up next, we have Treasurer Zach Conine, who is going to talk to us about all things, I'm assuming, bonds and all of the things he loves. Um, so we are going to take a quick break. You are just going to hear music for this one, and we will be back with you in just a second. If you all want to get in touch with any of these fabulous panelists, please follow them on social media or get involved with their organizations. Lots of the links are in the chat. Thanks again, everyone. We will be back with you right after the music. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the music. Now we are going to transition right into uh, a little, a few words by our fabulous treasurer, who's just reelected. Thank goodness, Treasurer Zach Conine, who we are a big fan of over here at BBP. He is going to be talking to us today about all the good things that the treasurer's office has worked on the past four years and what's coming up in the next four years. And then Will is going to do some Q and A with him. So. Treasurer, I want to bring you in. Welcome to the summit. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, really excited to be back. Um, so I just want to thank Battle Work Progress for putting on another successful progressive summit for all their hard work to engage and mobilize voters to build a state where everyone can succeed. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I have the pleasure of being the 23rd treasurer of the great state of Nevada. Uh, and they have asked me to talk for the next three and a half hours on bonds and assorted credit facilities. So everybody get comfortable, need a drink or something, just do that um, because we're, we're going to be here for a little bit of time. Um, so whenever I have a group of people, I like to make sure that folks know what the treasurer does, uh, since a lot of folks outside of my own family do not. Uh, the treasurer is one of six constitutional officers. I used to refer to us as the cons. I've been asked to stop, uh, but the six constitutional officers in the state are all listed in the constitution, right? There shall be a governor, there shall be a lieutenant governor, et cetera. Um, and it goes in that order. There's a governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, uh, state treasurer, state controller, and attorney general. The treasurer and the controller, a lot of people might wonder how to tell us apart, uh, especially now that um, Andy is over there. Uh, but the controller is the state's chief accountant and the treasurer is the state's chief investor. And so our work at its core is about taking a little bit of opportunity off the table now to create a little bit more opportunity later, right? To invest in Nevadans. Now we do a few different things. We manage all the cash in and out of the state. So anytime money comes into the state or, or goes out of the state, that comes through me. So every time you go to the DMV and pay to re-register your car, thanks. Uh, that comes to us if you start a business uh, and pay the Secretary of State, thanks. That comes to us. Uh, and anytime somebody gets paid by the state, that comes through us. 
in between the time we get it and the time we spend it, we invest it. Um, so as of this morning, I manage a portfolio of about $10.2 billion. Um, and we've had some really great investment returns in pretty boring things. Uh, treasuries, agencies, commercial paper, corporate notes, Bitcoin, things that don't move up and down too much, right? It's just really kind of mellow investments. Uh, we also manage debt. So my time the state borrows money to build anything, roads, bridges, schools, uh, that comes through us. And since I've been treasurer, we've had two credit rating upgrades, and we currently have the highest credit rating in the history of the state. I'm happy to talk a little bit more about how important that is um, somewhere around hour two. We also manage all the college savings programs in the state, so the Governor Wynn Millennium Scholarship, as well as um, College Kickstarter 529 assets, which are like 401ks, but for college and all of that works through our office. And finally, we manage unclaimed property, which is a fun little government party trick in which you lose money along the way. It ends up with us. We give it back to you and take credit for it. Uh, we have returned more unclaimed property, or at least in the next 15 days or so, I will have returned more unclaimed property than any other treasurer in any other period of time uh, in state history. We've returned more than $130 million to Nevada, so we're really excited about that. Um, we've really kind of focused on different ways to give that back. Now, in addition to all of that, uh, we have had over the last few years some opportunities to lean in and help when leaning in and helped uh, became necessary. We expanded our higher education program when I came into the Treasury. Uh, that program was mostly about helping folks uh, avoid paying taxes. Now it's about helping every Nevadan find a way to higher education, whatever that looks like, right? It used to be just universities and with universities and colleges. And now we realize, uh, as has the rest of the world, that everyone's path might not be through there. It might be through a fantastic trade union, or joining the military, learning another skill. And we want to make sure that Nevadans have the resources they need, regardless of where they come from, in order to access those opportunities. We also created, uh, with the help of, of Assemblyman Howard Watts, the first student loan ombudsperson in Nevada history. And that's an individual in our office who works with loan holders after they've graduated from college to try to come up with the best uh, possibility. Now, this became really important uh, back when it was education with Secretary uh, DeVos because they created a public service loan forgiveness uh, program at the federal level, right, where if you work for a certain amount of time in public service, like say at an in inner city hospital or uh, you're working at a Title I school, you would get your loans forgiven. But the first time somebody went to go try and get that done, they got denied. And something like 99.5% of people who applied for it got denied because it was set up to fail. And so our office worked with those holders, with those teachers and nurses and doctors uh, and others in order to get their loans forgiven. We've helped uh, more than 100 students so far uh, get their loans totally wiped out. And we think that's like deeply, deeply important. And then, of course, as Nevada's been dealing with the higher prices, uh, a little bit lower at the pump now, but grocery store if anyone's bought eggs recently obviously you know what a mess that's been we've been focused on using unclaimed property as a way of getting money back to nevadans especially when they need it and to that end instead of unclaimed property being receptive we have started pushing it out uh, without the person contacting us first we started that during the pandemic the height of the pandemic with unclaimed uh, property and um, unemployment insurance so we realized just statistically that some people who had filed for unemployment insurance also would have unclaimed property. So for the first time in state history, we actually reached out to them to say, hey, you know, Bob, sorry, lost your job, uh, but we've got some money there. We found more than $10 million of unclaimed property owned to people uh, who had lost their jobs. So we're going to continue that work and make sure we can get back as much property as possible. Uh, we did a few other things during the pandemic you might have heard about. Brent. Uh, a program called PETS, the Pandemic Emergency Technical Support Grant Program, which was more than $100 million uh, to small businesses, largest state uh, aid program in history, uh, run by four people in a spreadsheet. Uh, we helped on the foreclosure and forbearance uh, protections from homeowners, including a lot of times calling banks directly on behalf of homeowners. Uh, it's remarkable who you can get on the phone uh, when you're the treasurer. So if anyone ever needs somebody to call back, just give us a call. Uh, we put together a program that would become CHAP, the coronavirus housing assistance program which uh unfortunately ended recently due to the just the end of the program and, and the end of the, the financial structure behind it but showed us how much inequity we have in housing and how important it was uh, for government to take an active role there we created a first in the nation program called tots the transforming opportunities for toddlers and students and for anybody who hasn't heard me say this uh we have a real fantastic team in the treasury uh, and i don't get to pay them enough because you know the state uh and so we let them name things so that's why we have chap and Pets, tots. Uh, we had for a bit of time the commercial rental assistance program, but we call it that before we went to print. So we made it the commercial rental assistance grant program, CRAG instead of CRAP, which I think landed better. Um, 
but tops the transforming opportunities for toddlers and students help put 12 million dollars in the hands of families with kids with disabilities who are suffering from learning loss in the pandemic and then of course we conducted the largest statewide engagement tour uh ever um in the nevada covers listening tour when we got those arpa dollars in wanted to make sure we spent them most effectively and i know a lot of people on this call uh and a lot of people around the state participated in the 123 uh, meetings we did around the state, more than 80,000 points of feedback um, that you then saw come through in the governor's, Governor Sislak's $500 million Home Means Nevada program, additional money for mental health care, et cetera, et cetera. And now we have a, a really great working list um, of things that need to get done. And not just what needs to get done, because I think we all do a pretty good job of identifying what could be better in the state, uh, but how best to execute on the ground. We think it's really important uh, to make sure that we're talking to Nevadans and meeting them where they live to, to best devise the government policy that's going to help them most. And then we've created some long-term investments, right? We've uh, reconfigured the state infrastructure bank to be able to invest in things like housing and education, green energy projects, and desalination and other water resource projects and funded it for the first time, uh, which will lead to an investment of more than half a billion dollars in the state over the next few years. We've worked with the um, AFL-CIO's affordable, uh, excuse me, housing investment trust, which is a mutual fund, in order to bring hundreds of millions of dollars of housing investment into the state. Um, and we're working on a few programs uh, with legislation right now to help break generational poverty in the way that the Treasury does best, which is investing now to create a lot of bit of opportunity in the future. So that's a real quick version of what we do in the Treasury and some of the stuff we've been doing, I think. Uh, for a long time, uh, at least since the 1860s, the Treasury has been generally pretty quiet uh, unless something's gone wrong. We think it's a fantastic opportunity to look for ways to help folks, and uh, we'll continue to do that. We continue to appreciate any and all feedback as we go uh, to, you know, as I know, uh, Annette certainly has no trouble telling me when we've done something right and probably even less trouble telling me when we've done something wrong. Uh, and that's the kind of feedback that we need along the way. So I'm happy to take any questions about literally anything to do with government uh, with the general caveat that it's probably not my fault. Well, thank you for that, Treasurer Conite, and we really appreciate your service uh, since the 1800s to our, our state. And uh, thank you very much for, for not uh, talking to us for three hours about bonds, although maybe next summit we'll pencil that in on the agenda and, and make sure you, you get the time you need. Um, Could be three days. <laughs> yeah, we'll add an additional day to the summit and we'll just have a bond. Uh, great. Well, thank you so much again. I had a couple of questions before you before we take a few from our chat. Uh, again, for those who tuning in. My name is Will Pregman. I'm the communications director here at Battleborn Progress. And my first question for you, Treasurer, is uh, I heard a lot about this on the campaign trail, uh, you speaking about the state's credit rating and how that has improved, actually, under your tenure in the office. Could you talk to us about what the state's credit rating is and what uh, your office is doing with that and how is that benefiting the average Nevada? Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing I like talking about more than credit rating, so I appreciate uh, the prompt. So a credit rating for a state functions a lot like a credit score for an individual. When the state's credit rating is higher, we're able to borrow more money and we pay less uh, in order to borrow it. And the credit rating and a credit score function in a very similar way, which is a higher credit score or a higher credit rating is effectively a third party saying that they believe that that person or agency or state is more likely to be able to pay back money if it's loaned to them, right? It's real kind of kind of clean. And so one of the things that we realized when we came in is that credit ratings on the state level and on the municipal level are a combination of quantitative and qualitative factors, right? There's some how much debt do you have outstanding? How much tax revenue are you taking in? Are you able to pay back the debt you have outstanding? Right, it's a math problem. But there's also a qualitative piece. And in the past, treasurers before me, uh, for the most part, have let the credit rating process happen to them. They haven't been directly involved. And that didn't make a ton of sense to me. You know, before I was treasurer, I worked uh, in a lot of different small businesses, but started one of my own. Part of running a small business and helping a small business is helping them tell their story right here's what we do but also here's why we're doing it and here's why that's a good idea and here's what we think is going to happen and so we participate actively in the credit rating process and help them through what i think was a historic bias against nevada which is you know we obviously have a bit of a boom and bust economy we've been 
working to diversify our way out of that, but that's been happening for a fair amount of time, but showing the progress there, right? Showing the work that had been done um, to diversify the economy, we think was part of the reason why we got the upgrade. In the past, we have always taken uh, one notch down because of these qualitative feelings. And, and frankly, you know, people who aren't from Nevada might not get exactly who we are and why we do what we do, uh, but we thought it was important to tell that story. Now, here's what that means for Nevada. Because of that, we were able to issue debt um, during sort of the middle of the pandemic at the, the lowest cost of borrowing that the state has ever had in its history, which means we we're able to borrow more money, right? and pay less for the privilege of borrowing more money, which allows us to build more schools, allows us to put more money into open space, allows us to do all of these other things because we can bond to say build a state building um, or to you know preserve a park or to do um, environmental work out at Tahoe. That's money that we can then, we don't have to spend today. We can spend it over time, which means there's more money to spend today on things like mental health and per pupil allocation and affordable housing and various other things. The state's credit rating allows us more opportunity um, basically to do whatever we need to do. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. We're coming close on the time. I do want to ask you as well. We had Attorney General Ford and Secretary Aguilar joining us yesterday, laid out a couple of the bills that they're going to be working on in the upcoming session. Can you give us a little preview of what the Treasurer's Office is going to be sponsoring this session? For sure. So we get five BDRs uh, every session. Some of them are about investments, their cleanup bills, you know, try to make sure the office is functioning as effectively as it can. Some that we're really uh, focused on one way of an unclaimed property bill that will allow us to do data share uh, with different state and local entities. One of the things we found is that data in the state is very siloed, right? So we can't, for instance, right now, take the list of people who are um, who are applying for and get SNAP benefits or EBT benefits or WIC benefits and look to see if they have unclaimed property. We can't look at uh, folks who are receiving restitution or folks who are in, um, who are incarcerated and see if they have unclaimed property automatically. We're going to be able to get that functionality. We also have a bill um, to increase uh, public student loan forgiveness and attract doctors to underserved areas. Um, so that would take some of those unclaimed property proceeds and use them to do tuition reimbursement uh, for nurses and doctors and mental health providers in underserved communities, but either rural communities or um, in areas where the density of providers is not significant enough. So like North Las Vegas, right? Um, and we also want to make sure that, that uh, those dollars can be used for women's health care, knowing what we think is in front of us uh, as, as especially on the 50th anniversary of Robert Schwitt, you know, the, as we start to see those rights contract in other states, knowing that Nevada is likely to be a haven uh, for some of those providers. And then the third thing that we're doing uh, bill-wise is we have a bill to try baby bonds pilot. Baby bonds, uh, which Senator Booker uh, has been pushing for quite some time at the national level and exists in a few other states, you basically take a, a set amount of money, give it to a population of a uh, child born. In our bill, it's uh, individuals who are born where their birth is paid by Medicaid. And then that bill would those bonds would follow them uh, through the rest of their lives. So when they hit 18, they would have money for higher education or to purchase a home or to start a business or whatever. And it's a way to try and break the cycle of generational poverty, right? Because we know that the first individual who breaks out of that cycle, typically, right, their progeny are more likely um, to have success after that. And so the kind of the more we can get there, the better off we'll be. Um, I did see there was one question if I could that came through the chat. If I got 30 seconds, and why is the treasurer an elected vote? Um, it's a great question, one that comes up a lot. And the big reason for it is because it's one of those positions in government where having somebody whose moral compass matches your own matters, right? And we saw what happened last night in California. You know, we decided, I decided in the Treasury uh, about a year ago that we were going to divest from all uh, manufacturers and retailers of assault style weapons. And not only did we do that at the state level, but we also worked to make sure that other states knew how we had done it, why we'd done it, we led to some uh, divestment around the country, other states and municipalities. The, the work of investing requires not just the financial knowledge, but also some level of moral compass. It requires a willingness to understand how the world works. Um, and that's something that you're just more likely to get out of a person who's elected um, than someone you hire, right? It's another check and balance in there, and we think it's important. Excellent. Um, really super fast. Uh, we do have a question in the chat I want to get to. It's from Sue Bird. Um, she asks, uh, so glad you're back to the 
investment money it received last year, I'm assuming that's referring to American Rescue Plan uh, and so on, can the government or can the governor move it? And if so, does that affect the budget? Yeah, so the most of those dollars have been allocated. Now, the process of allocating means they've either moved into a department or they've moved out, right? And they were granted to, say, a nonprofit or a local government to do a piece of work. We think broadly dollars that have moved out of the state, those are going to be fine. Dollars have been allocated within the state. The governor could try to reallocate those dollars, but he would have to bring that back to the legislature, right? Either through the interim finance committee or through the legislative process, right? So that there's there are some checks and balances there. Now, there are dollars that are in agencies that are um, sort of generally in agencies as opposed to very specifically defined, right? So, you know, they're going to go towards XYZ mental health, but the what type of mental health work has some level of flexibility to it, and the governor's going to have control of that, um, less of a budget process, more of an execution process. Um, one other question in there, uh, does Nevada invest in cryptocurrencies? We don't. Um, well, I think that blockchain technologies and stable coins have a real place in the universe. My first job is to not lose money. My second job is to not lose money. My third job is to make sure we have the liquidity available for us. And frankly, I don't know that Dogecoin gets me there. It's a good joke, though, and I, I enjoyed making it as often as I can, Austin. Uh, and then somebody said, how is it possible to lose $10 million? Well, every, out of every eight uh, Nevadans, one of them has unclaimed property. Uh, so that $10 million was uh, split amongst Oh gosh, I don't know, 300,000 or so Nevadans. One person didn't lose it. Thank you so much, Treasurer. I'm kicking it back to Annette to take us out and give you, um, take you out. Thank you. I'm not taking you out. I'm just going to move us to the next session. Uh, thank you, Treasurer, for being here today with us. Thanks for answering all those questions. I, too, make fun of crypto as much as humanly possible. Uh, and I appreciate you always being here and sharing with us and educating us on the Treasurer's Office because I don't think enough people understand it. For those at home, uh, we will put in the chat. It's claim it nevada.org it's all one word claim it nevada.org that is where you can go and find all your unclaimed property that the treasurer talks about all the time thank you worth, treasurer we'll see you soon thanks for having us in that worth mentioning it is almost valentine's day unclaimed property makes a wonderful gift have okay. a great day everyone thank you all right we'll be back with you in just a few minutes everyone All right, welcome back everyone. We are so excited to be joined by Senate Majority Leader Nicole Canazaro, one of my dear friends and Emerge sister. I am looking forward to this legislative session and getting to work with her in the Senate caucus. And the Senator is actually on her way to Carson City, so we may go in and out a little bit. So I'm asking everybody to be patient with technology here because she is literally driving to Carson City. Senator, welcome to the summit. Thank you for being here today with us. Uh, thank you, Annette, for having me um, and appreciate you being willing to let me jump on. And unfortunately, due to timing, I am driving today to Carson City, um, but it's a, it's a lovely day so far. So hopefully we don't hit too much snow. Uh, but just want to thank everyone for joining Battle for Progress Day, the Progressive Summit. It's always such a great event, um, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, as Annette mentioned, my name is Nicole Canazaro, and I have the honor of serving as the Senator from Senate District 6, and also as the first female majority leader for the first in the country, first in the U.S. history, uh, majority female legislature, which is uh, been a really wonderful experience to get to see uh, the, the body of the legislature changing to really start to resemble more of what our world looks like. Um, so for those of you who don't know a little bit about me, um, I grew up in Las Vegas. I'm born and raised in Nevada, and I grew up in a working class family. My parents were culinary Local 226 members. My mom was a food server. Uh, my dad was a bartender, and I watched them work really hard every single day to make sure that they could give my sisters and I every opportunity possible. 
for you know, their family. I was certainly lucky enough to grow up in a place where I also got a really good public school education. Um, graduated from Chaparral High School, go Cowboys, um, and also was able to attend the University of Nevada, you know, and you know, be from law school. Um, and so it's sort of that background and experience that has helped shape my role as a legislator and really does reinforce my belief in the need for organized labor, the, the role that our legislature should play in making sure that life does get better for those who too often get left behind. I think we have to do everything we can to create opportunities for families. Um, and for Nevada, it's just like me and, and my family. That's why over the last six years in the Nevada legislature, four of those I've uh, had the honor of serving as the Senate Majority Leader, we've worked to prioritize putting working families first. We're assuring that all Nevadans, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, or the zip code that you're born into, that you have every opportunity to be able to accomplish under Governor Sislak. Um, and this is frankly success that would just not have been possible without the help of organizations like Battle for Progress and without great years like that. So I want to thank everyone again for being here today because your work really does come into existence through the formulation of legislation because we are advocacy. Um, together, you know, the last few sessions we have worked to increase the minimum wage, we passed the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, both from the state of Nevada to the federal level, but also here in the state, and it's now part of our state constitution. We've expanded healthcare access and affordability. We've protected abortion access. We have further protected our public lands here in the state. We've been more accessible. We've invested in making sure that we're supporting working families. Um, and there are dozens of other policy pieces that really don't have the time to kind of go through that whole list that are improving the lives of the Nevadans every single day. These are real and steps, frankly, that I intend to backtrack. But here, this legislature about to go into is going to look a lot different than the legislative sessions that we've seen the last few years. A Republican governor needs more negotiating and not getting some of the things that we want. But I can tell you right now that one thing that I remain committed to and what my colleagues remain committed to in the Nevada Senate, but we are not going to be going. And so I know that the road ahead is going to be steep. I know there are going to be challenges, but I also believe that there are areas in which we really are going to be able to move the ball down the field where we are going to deliver real results for real Nevadans and keep ensuring that progress in Nevada is happening each and every day. We're going to keep working to strengthen our elections. We're going to keep protecting the right to choose for the state. We're going to improve our public schools, work on housing to ensure that it is both accessible and affordable. We're going to continue to protect our environment for generations to come. And we're going to ensure a level playing field for So again, thank you for being here today. Thank you for your work to help improve our state. Um, and for inviting me to spend some time with you. I can't stress this enough. This, if this job, what we do at the legislature, what we're able to accomplish doesn't happen um, because I'm in Carson City or because there's a governor in a governor's office. It really does happen because of the work of everyday advocates who are out there making sure that causes are brought to our attention and we're working on them. So without supporters like you each advocating for the issues that you care about, coming to things like the Progressive Summit, where you can learn about different ways to engage, it's really impossible for us to make the kind of progress that we have made so far. So please keep investing in your communities, keep advocating, and know that your work and your dedication is so important to the work that we get to do together. Um, I'm thrilled with the successes that my Democratic colleagues and I have had these last few sessions. And again, I remain hopeful for what we are going to achieve as we move forward this legislative year. It is always our goal to create sound policy that builds an even stronger foundation in Nevada for generations to come. I know that that's possible because I have lived it and I have seen it. Um, and so, you know, just know that together we really can work to make all of that a reality. So thank you very much. And I am happy to answer questions or or wherever you want to go with this. So thanks again for having me. Yes, thank you so much, Majority Leader. Thank you for being with us. I had just a few questions really quick so you can get back to your trip. Um, my first question is last session, you sponsored a bill on the public health insurance option, SB 420. Uh, we were honored to help work on that uh, and support that bill with you last session. Can you give us an update on where things are at with the implementation of that program? 
Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, I'm really proud of Senate Bill 420, and again, I think it's um, absolutely proof of what you know we can all do together to really advocate for policy so we can make a difference. Um, SB 420 implements the Nevada Public Option, which is a health insurance option that would be uh, more affordable over time and also more accessible to one We know that Nevada has historically had a very stagnant and much short rate, um, due in large part because of the inability for Nevada to afford insurance. Um, and also any insurance that they can't afford kind of not being what they can really access, right? Not enough providers, not the right kind of coverage. Um, and that results in a really big number of Nevadans just being uninsured. Uh, which is not a great place for more people have access to health care. And so the public option was created um, in order to establish that insurance option that will be more affordable, that will be accessible to those that is who don't otherwise have good quality health care through, say, an employer. Um, and so part of that legislation included an actuarial analysis um, that we are required to do in order to get some federal waiver dollars. That actuarial has been completed and then now and the data from that actuarial actually came back with a lot of really great news for Nevada. Um, I think that one of the things that we should stay focused on is that that, that data shows us that we can start to approve, improve affordability and access for up to 100,000 Nevadans. And over time, um, even within the first five years, we can see the money, federal dollars, coming back to the state of Nevada to the tune of about 500 million. Um, and it starts to reach about a 50 million over a 10 year mark. That insurance option would also reduce costs for insurance for that insurance option by 16% over four years. Um, and so those are some really great benchmarks. We've seen some good data on how to implement this. And so we are in the process of going through that. One of the things that has happened, unfortunately, is that Governor Lombardo's administration has delayed the public comment period on federal waiver application until later this year. Um, we have to submit a waiver to the federal government by January 1st of 2020. And that allows them to basically review the public option plan that we have um, and say, yes, you know, we are going to give you these waiver dollars. Those waiver dollars can go to the state of Nevada. And that's money that we can really use to invest in healthcare here, right? To help bring it down the cost of prescriptions, to make sure that we have families who can access affordable health care here, where we can help to support providers. Um, all of the things that we see in our health care system, having those uh, waiver dollars can certainly help us to invest in. And I think having a good, strong public option and ensuring that many more Nevadans will make a difference uh, for families. So I'm looking forward to continuing to see the public option uh, move down that road. Obviously, the public comment period has been delayed, uh, but that we are expecting to start again back in November of this year. And so we're going to keep making sure that that, that game plan is in place um, and looking forward very much to the public option actually come here to Nevada for Nevada's. Thank you for that update. We'll be watching that issue closely. Um, my second question is, of course, today would have been the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. We uh, put out a statement on that this morning, and I was reported earlier this week in the Review Journal that you might have a bill uh, addressing some of these issues. Uh, can you talk to us about what you and the Senate Dems are planning to do on the issue of protecting abortion access this coming session? Absolutely. Um, and you know, I think it's a it's a somber, I guess lack of an anniversary, it's not an anniversary, but it's a somber day, right? Because there are so many people who just had their rights completely stripped from them, rights that have been in place for longer, I mean, longer than I have been alive. Um, and so I, I know, gosh, I know that when that decision came down, that people all across Nevada, myself included, the country, you know, you get terrified that the Supreme Court is going to come in and just overturn 50 years of precedent um, and strip away rights so easily with a stroke of a pen. And these are really right it's to make your own healthcare decisions, to make the decisions that are best for your body, for your family. Um, and, and that can't be understated enough. Uh, so let me be very clear about where me and my colleagues stand. So long as there is a Democratic majority in the legislature, we will be standing up, we will be speaking out, we will be protecting the right to reproductive health care and abortion access in our state. Um, we've seen that over the last few sessions. We, you know, we talked about the progress that we've been able to make together, and we have worked for, over the last few sessions to really expand access um, for Nevadans. We passed the Trust Nevada Women's Act in 2018, 
2019, which removed antiquated criminal penalties uh, for women and for people who are seeking abortions. Uh, we made sure that patients who are receiving their health care, their reproductive health care information from a doctor that was medically reliable um, and accurate, only you know, was available to them in the language that they understood. And those are just, I think, some steps that we've taken that really do make a difference and, and why I think the bill that, that I'm sponsoring this session is so important. You know, when the Dobbs decision came down, Governor Sisolak had acted to implement an executive order. And that executive order basically says, if you are someone who is coming to Nevada to seek abortion access and reproductive care, that we are not going to assist another state in prosecuting. We're not going to prosecute you. We're not going to assist them. Um, it also says to providers who are operating in Nevada that we are not going to assist another state who may try to come for you and seek criminal penalties for the practice that you're working here in Nevada, um, that we're going to protect you. And I think when you look at a healthcare system like Nevada where we lack provider access, um, where we are really a state that from early on in the 1990s said, you know, right to reproductive care, to abortion, something like that. Of the vast majority of Nevada uh, support and want part of our statutory system here, that we should be doing everything we can to really strengthen that. And so that's the reason for this legislation. Um, I don't think that's the end of the discussion, this legislative session on reproductive access, uh, but that is at least one of the bills that I am running at the computer for. Oh, there you are. Sorry. Um, I'll say sorry. We knew it was going to happen. It's all good. Well, you want. Please have a short one then. Yeah. Well, you want to ask about the governor really quickly before we let the senator continue with her drive? Sure. I'll kind of sort of combine these questions. So, um, uh, last question, really quick, is uh, what your estimation do you see as? some of the priority issues that you're going to be working on this session and what are you feeling about um the, the new administration um and the, the general vibe around that yeah so i you know i think we spent a lot of time uh, my colleagues and i this election cycle um knocking on doors talking to constituents getting out in the community hearing the things that are on the top of their minds um so i think you're going to see a lot of us continue to focus on workforce development I'm making sure that we're investing in education and we're ensuring that public education is something that you know, every Nevada child can access and get a good quality education for supporting our teachers. You're going to see us continue to as in the country, you're seeing a lack of affordable housing. Um, we worked with the governor, you know, to use some of our ARPA dollars, 500 million, to invest in the Health Needs Nevada program, which is going to seem to increase and build affordable and accessible housing for seniors and underserved populations. Um, so, you know, we've taken a lot of steps in that direction. I think that we're going to continue to work on that and try to find some solutions for working families and for Nevadans to help with the costs and help make sure that housing is more stable because you know, not having stable housing really does affect just about every other facet of your life. Um, so that is definitely something that you're going to see us work on. And of course, you know, we talked a little bit about um, the expansion of healthcare in terms of accessibility and affordability. And I think you're going to see us continue to work on that. Uh, you know, my colleagues and I remain very dedicated to continuing the work that we've been doing, right? It's the right for the bad ends, um, not just because we think it, but because we're out there talking to folks. We're out there at the case. We're asking them, you know, what's going on and, and how can we help as legislators? And so I think that's also why you saw so many of us um, either win the election or, or win seats. Um, and, you know, we have larger majorities going into this legislative session because of it, because we're out there talking to folks. So we're going to keep pushing for that. We are hopeful that the governor in his campaign has also had a chance to talk to Nevadans, right? And that he's here, because if he does, I guarantee he's hearing the same things that we are. I guarantee that he's having those same conversations because there are very few people that we go out to and talk to who are talking about, you know, hey, policy is an issue. What are you doing about my kids' education? Um, these are important things. And so we're hopeful that he's done that as well. 
I don't know where he's going to land on some of this stuff. We haven't heard a lot of details. Tomorrow is the state of the state, um, which is also <laughs> what I'm going up right now um, to Carson and not, and not later. Um, so we don't really know what some of his detailed plans are. I know some of the things he's talked about are not things that they're, they're, they're things that are going to take us backwards, right? Like, we don't talk about vouchers. That is not a conversation we are having. Um, you know, we have to invest in public education. We can't put a qualified teacher and pay them what they are owed in every classroom in the state. Why are we talking about taking taxpayer dollars and giving them to private corporations? Um, so I'm hopeful that he has done some of that work on the campaign trail as well to hear from constituents so that we can work on some of these policies together. I know my colleagues and I are gonna keep fighting for that. Um, and we'll see kind of more of what he hears what we hear him say tomorrow uh, and you know we just have to keep doing though i think what's best for nevada so that's the job we got elected to do uh, that's the job that we're focused on doing and so you know, we remain hopeful that we'll be able to find some ways we can actually solve a lot of these problems together uh, but in the end you know the one thing i can say for certain is that democrats in the senate are committed to building on the work that we've done um, and continue to deliver for nevada Senator, I want to thank you for joining us on your way up to Carson City. You're amazing as usual. We appreciate you. And for those at home, we totally agree with the Senator. We are not going backwards on vouchers. We're not going backwards on voting rights. We're not going backwards on so many issues that we worked on the past several sessions together. So Senator, thank you for drawing that line in the sand and thank you for uh, standing up for the, the work that we've done together. We appreciate you. Now, thank you for all you guys are doing. Uh, thank you for putting together the progressive summit like i said it's always a great program um, we love that people are attending and engaged that's what we need right we need to be working together to do that and of course thank you Annette, for all of the amazing work that you continue to do every day so thanks for having me and thanks for dealing with our a little bit of technical difficulty since we are getting up to carson city you're good it worked out it was perfect all right thank you senator and uh nate drive safe i see you next to her so uh thanks everyone Safe travel, Senator. Thanks. Bye-bye. and listening to our incredible speakers. And thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, again, I'm Amber Falco. I'm the Northern Nevada Manager with uh, Battleborn Progress. And I'm here with a fantastic panel of uh, teachers, legislators, parents, and I couldn't be happier to get this discussion started. I have to start it by saying that, as you all just heard, apparently vouchers are a no-go in any name or form. So I think that's a wonderful way to kick off this panel because we're gonna be talking about what are vouchers, what is school choice, uh, and, and sort of fleshing those topics out. Uh, today, we have with us Assemblymember Selena Torres, Assemblymember Natha Anderson, Akiko Cooks, co-founder of No Racism in Schools 1865. We have Vicki Craigell, 
president of the National Education Association of Southern Nevada. Vicki is also an educator, so that is awesome. Uh, former, and finally, we have former Clark County trustee Daniel, Daniel Ford. Um, first, I want to go to Assembly Member Selena Torres. Um, she is also an educator, which I think gives her a very unique perspective on these issues, because not only is she a legislator, but she she teaches. So Selena, our assembly member, as a legislator and also a teacher, what solutions do you see for the desire that parents have to have more choice in and freedom in their children's education? We hear that a lot, that parents want choices, they want freedom and they want to be able to choose. So what do you see? How do we balance that with our current education system? Right, thank you. That, that, that's such a great question. You know, when I think about my students, uh, and when I think about the community that I represent, I think that there, there's this common desire for us to provide the best education available for our students. And the reality is, is a lot of our schools are just not meeting the cut. Um, and so in order for us uh, to really like, like when we're talking about like this concept of like educational freedom, educational choice, I really think that this goes back into this idea that like families want to provide their students with the best education. How do we do that? So really this conversation isn't just about school choice, it's about improving our schools and what do we have to do to improve our schools. Um, I think there's a number of things that we have to do. One, um, I, I need that we uh, obviously, uh, and I think, you know, uh, my colleagues on this panel would agree, like we have to make sure that we have enough teachers in the building and we have to make sure that we're paying those teachers fairly uh, for the work that we're we're doing you know a lot of our schools and when i think about the schools specifically in my district um, a lot of the the schools are struggling and part of the reason that they're struggling is that they don't have enough licensed teachers in the building um, when people don't want to go into this profession when you don't have enough educators in the classroom our schools and our students will pay the consequences. And so it's really critical that we make sure that we have enough teachers, that we build that pipeline, um, and that we make sure that teachers feel supported so that they want to stay in this profession. And you know, I, I know that there's been lots of conversations about like teacher mental health in the last couple of years, but I, I don't think that this is a new thing. This is a conversation that we've had for, for decades now. Uh, it's, a, I think, something that we really have to focus on um, during the legislative session. Uh, additionally, I think that we need to find ways to ensure that schools have the resources that they need to be successful. You know, when, when parents are deciding, like, when, when they're looking into schools in their area, um, they're, my, they're, they're checking to see, does that school uh, even have curriculum? My first year teaching, I actually I taught high school English uh, school in East Las Vegas and had literally no textbooks, no books of any sort for me to teach a high school English class. There is no way that I was able to provide my students with the high quality education that they deserve because I just didn't have the resources. And so, you know, if, if we want to have have the uh, have a conversation about school choice, uh, I think that really the conversation has to be more centered on what do we do to improve the schools that we have in our communities that are currently serving our kids. How do we make sure that there's teachers in those classrooms? How do we make sure um, that parents can? can send their kids to the best schools uh, that they possibly can because that's ultimately I think the desire for most parents is how do I send my kid to the best school so we need to improve the schools that we have in our areas. Thank you for that Assemblywoman or Member Torres. I, you know that's one thing that I think as a parent I can certainly relate to right is that you always as a parent you want the best for your children you want them to have the best education and sometimes in our society unfortunately your zip code determines that outcome and too often i think parents feel like that is rightly unfair and unjust um you kind of answered the second question was how do we improve our our public education you know our schools um i wonder if you could elaborate on the importance of what teachers deal with and and the pay that they have right so teachers are oftentimes seen as a student's counselor, they're seen as their teacher, they're, you know, so elaborate a little bit on that comprehensive role that teachers have and sort of how little they're paid for such an important and, and, and vast job that they do. Uh, that, that's definitely a topic that, you know, I'm passionate about is ensuring that teachers are paid fairly, uh, especially for the, the the complex roles that they play and the important, critical role that they have in the development of our society as a whole. Uh, I'm the daughter of an educator and the granddaughter of a teacher because my grandpa on my dad's side is also um, a teacher and was a principal in El Salvador. And so uh, for me, education has kind of been instilled uh, in me at a very young age, you know, growing 
I, I didn't just go to school. I grew up in a school, I say, because my mom was taking us um, every staff day and every holiday. Uh, teachers do a lot more work than just the work that they're putting in during the school day, um, but, um, which are generally very busy, very packed. Um, they're putting in time before school, they're staying after school, they're grading papers on the weekends. Um, that, as an English teacher, I know that that's something um, that is almost just like a norm. Like, you, there's no way for you to grade all of your papers during your 55 minute craft um, that you get one, every single day. It's just not possible. Um, they're planning lessons, they're trying, they're purchasing supplies oftentimes out of their own funds. Um, and so there's a critical need to ensure that we are paying our teachers fairly for the work that they're doing um, and that it's a lucrative profession. Um, one of the things that I know in the past, uh, the past legislative session, we looked at bills um, in regards to paraprofessionals to ensure that they had easier access to becoming licensed teachers um, and that we were able to kind of streamline that student teaching process, um, which really requires individuals interested in becoming student teachers or becoming teachers uh, to work unpaid for several months, um, essentially a semester of their school time. Um, and, and that doesn't attract people to our profession, especially when they know that, you know, when they start, the, the starting teacher salary is not comparative to the salaries that they might get uh, in other professions with a four-year degree to start out. Um, you know, I think there have been some improvements. I know that, you know, many districts um, used funds uh, that they we receive federally um, to give our teachers an increase in pay, um, but it's not enough. I think that there's still more that we can do. Um, you know, here in Southern Nevada, I think there's a lot of conversations that can be had regarding uh, the teacher health trust um, and how we can ensure that teachers have uh, strong medical coverage. Um, and I know that this is a conversation that that many educators have had, um, ensuring that their services are provided for, making sure that the health trust is actually paying our teachers' bills, um, I, I think is a big, is a very critical thing for our teachers. So I, I don't know that it's all just like about teacher pay, but about all of the different things that impact a teacher, right? So making sure that we protect their PERS, the retirement system, um, making sure that we have strong benefits for our teachers, making sure we value teachers as a society, making sure that, that we're not passing legislation that continues to um, or punitively punishing educators, um, making sure that we're rewarding educators that have done the time and continue to teach in our district, um, not just attracting new teachers, but then supporting the teachers that are in the district that are already doing the work. Um, and I think really uh, finding ways to, to bring in those experienced teachers into Title I schools um, and, and schools that serve in historically disenfranchised communities, um, because that's where we really need experienced teachers. Quite honestly, we talk about like, why, why, why is this idea of school choice um, so, um, so appetizing? And like, why, why do people want that? It's because they know that there are certain schools in our community that are better off than other schools. Um, and so we need to make sure that those teachers, those same resources that we provide at our most affluent schools are available um, in urban parts of our community as well. Thank you so much for that, Assemblymember Torres. Uh, and that's really the crux of it, I think, right? It is that if we could send our kids to better schools when we live in specific neighborhoods, we would, and people know that. So it makes it a really easy thing to attach to, like attach on to, right? Because you want that for your kids. Next, I wanna go to assembly member, Natha Anderson, who is also an educator. Um, assembly member Anderson, what is your experience as an educator with school choice and the voucher system? So so how does how do you see school choice and the voucher system. What are your thoughts? Well, first, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, sorry about my voice. As you just stated, I am a teacher and I love my kids. But those little germ carriers got me sick. Um, so I think the experiences that I've had, uh, I've been teaching for about 25 years. And so I have gone through a little bit of the experience that we had with the education saving accounts or whatever they were being called, which really were a little bit of a voucher. Um, a number of years ago, we had students that were going to private schools, and then when they were not cutting it within the first six weeks, they were put back into our classrooms. That was after count day, that was after other things had happened. So then our resources, we were already figuring out how many students we would have for our school and everything, and it became very difficult. So that's one little bit of my experience. The larger thing though that, I, that I've had, a um, much stronger experience with it is my students that come back from going to a private school and then 
find out that it's not what they thought it would be. And so then they come back the following year. Um, this happened to me this year just with six students and my, I don't know, 190, 200 kids that I teach this year. I had six of them that had gone to a private school last year um, based upon other reasons and they came back to our school. And the things that I'm hearing from them was number one, wow, this is a lot tougher than I thought it would be at the public school. And so many people are buying into this, um, how do I say it, into the narrative that some people try to put out there. Our schools are great. I mean, are they perfect? Gosh, no. We still have two, our class sizes are still too large. And as uh, Assemblymember Torres just brought up perfectly, our teachers are working as hard as they can as our, our school professionals. And we're trying to do everything on a shoestring budget, but we're still trying to help our kids learn. And too many kids and parents are not thinking that way. And then when they come, they come out, they find out, oh, the grass is not quite as green as the thought it would be. So I think that's a biggie. The other thing that, that I've seen, people have this idea of what public school would be like. And it's always the movie idea, not the reality. Um, as unfortunately you've had to state, and I believe Assemblymember Torres also stated, we have this idea of the zip codes. That doesn't mean though the students are not getting a great education based upon the zip codes, uh, or trying our best to do the best that we can. Uh, based upon the zip codes, but there's this mentality and we've got to do something about that. Um, so my experiences with school choice, I've actually, my students that have made the decision to go to Team CC High School, uh, which is a school that is part of Washington County School District, but it also offers college credit. I believe there are some that are similar to that in Clark County. My students that have made a decision to do that at the end of their sophomore year, they've excelled. They loved it. Um, I've had some students also make a decision to go to signature academies. Those kind of signature academies are part of the same school district. Those work great. So I think the idea of school choice only being for private schools is completely mystifying. And we need to really be a little bit more realistic. Are we talking about for profit schools, which unfortunately we have more and more of those cropping up? Or do we mean public schools that might have some different elements attached to it, such as, um, and I'm going to use all mine are going to be from Washington County, sorry, such as, um, let's say, AACT, which actually has a culinary portion, or we have our McQueen High School, which has a language arts area where people can actually start taking more than one or two languages, or Mount Rose Elementary School, which I think is where your children go, which have um, full immersion programs. So what exactly do we mean by school choice? Do we mean public schools offering more opportunities and more classes? Or is it is a private school that parents can basically dictate exactly what's going to be taught? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Assembly Member Anderson. Uh, next, I want to ask you, how can students and parents work together to have a more productive relationship that promotes a positive learning environment? in public schools. I know you love this question and I wanted to give you a good talk about it. It's so important for us to talk with each other. My gosh, I love, um, I'm such a geek, I'll admit it, but I, uh, the first year of school, I have to call my, like either email or call. It's tough though, I'm not going to lie to you because when you've got 200 kids on your caseload, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. So we've got to start to address the class sizes. That's got to be number one, but moving on. Well, that's got to be one and two. Moving on. Um, so if we get a chance to sit and talk with each other, the parent-teacher nights should not just be, hey, here's the syllabus, let's move on. It should be, okay, what's going on with your child? Um, what? How, how do I help? But also, and I teach high school, so I'm kind of in a different world. I encourage parent-teacher-student conferences. If a student is having a problem in my class, I try to have all three of us be part of it. Because guess what? If it's just the parent and teacher, nothing's going to get done. The most important person in that conversation has got to be part of it, and that's the student. I know many of our IEPs or individual education plans, um, there was a big movement right before uh, COVID-19 hit to try to have students be the ones to run that, starting about their eighth grade year. I don't know if that process is still going as far as it should, but truly, the student is the most important person in that individual education plan. They should be the ones running it about eighth or ninth grade. 
they can be the ones to tell us what's going on. But that takes trust, and that also takes realistic expectations of educators, whether that educator's title might be teacher or counselor. And right now, with our caseloads and the number of people on, that we're expected to both meet with as counselors or teach as teachers, it's not realistic. We're looking at counselors that have almost 400 people. And in Clark County, it's even higher. We're looking at teachers who have 200 to 300 people that they get a chance to teach. But how in the world can we figure out how to do that one-to-one? -one? Now that's in secondary. In primary or first through fourth grade, we're still looking at numbers that are not realistic. We're still looking at a teacher to possibly 25 or 26. I'm sorry, you get more than three first graders. I'd rather have a zoo full of pterodactyls of high school. But more than three first graders, that's a lot of personalities to deal with. So if you're looking at 25 people in a first grade class, how do you do those individual education plans? How do you sit down and say, this is what we need to do differently? So I don't think I answered the question, but I might have a little bit. You're okay. No, and you brought up some great points. I really appreciate it. And I, I tend to agree, especially with the class sizes. I saw that even with my own child. Uh, next, I do want to go to Akiko. Um, so Akiko, do vouchers, private school vouchers, make private school affordable for lower income families? And is, is private school attainable with those types of coupons that we've seen in the past? Amber, thank you for having me. Um, so for lower income families, no. Uh, we're talking about a voucher being about $5,000 or so. Um, when you have a tuition, which is about what, 15,000 for the year or something like that. Um, so you, you know, kind of like a little coupon that you give to a family that can't afford to pay $10,000 um, in addition to the coupon for the private school um, and then don't have more than one student, right? Like you don't want to pick, well, I'm going to send this one, but I can't afford to send, you know, these two. Um, and then a lot of the times um, my community, especially isn't fully um, educated on vouchers, what they do, where they go. And then they get into the school and realize that it's not what they thought it was. Um, and that's just from an educational level. We won't talk about the social level with the racism and the bias that is happening in the schools um and then you get there and now you're kind of stuck also like oh my goodness I, you know i'm understanding what it means to be paying ten thousand dollars a year um and it not actually be what you thought it would be of course we all want a good education we want quality education but quality education doesn't exist without it being safe it doesn't exist without being supported. It doesn't exist without feeling like you are actually wanted and you belong there. Um, and we'll just be frank. We know that in a lot of private school settings, racism bias um, is big and um, culturally centering people is not a priority. So you're paying to send your student money that you actually probably don't have but of course you know we want our students to have a quality education so in our minds we're like you know what i'll work this second job to you know to pay towards this tuition thank you for the five thousand dollars but when you have a family that actually has uh the means they they can actually afford to do the ten thousand dollars without you know any without even thinking about it um it's it's very one-sided but you would have to know that to know that it's one-sided. All of that information is not shared openly with um, with the community. Definitely, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, do you believe, Akiko, that the school choice narrative that we hear, which is really kind of a lot of rhetoric a lot of times, do you believe that that has students and parents' best interests at heart? not students and parents that look like me <laughs> or close to me. No, they don't. Um, they box it up, they gift wrap it up to look that way, but no, not at all. Again, quality education does not exist without safety and without cultural centering um, and without having educators who actually know or care to do um, culturally responsive teaching, if, if, if you may, to, to that 
because we know that in these private schools upward of fifteen thousand dollars and that's at a minimum um and even if it is a family because not all black families or families of color are you know in poverty they can actually afford her to but i've spoken with many many families that have sent their kids to these private schools or they've done school choice and they're like yeah no that wasn't the best um and again you know we had a conversation earlier about zip codes well i live in the arborview zip code area which is not a title one school and both of my kids lack their education because it's a racist area so um and, and I often heard, well, why don't you send them to another school? That's easier said than done because sending them to another school is not something that it's not like I would get a bus, right? So now I have to incur an additional cost because now I have to figure out how to get them to school every day. So it's lots of different things that are happening that no, not for people who look like me or almost look like me, um, that we're like we're being thought of, no it's gift wrapped to look that way. They'll come to our areas and talk to us because they know that they need our buy-in on it. But when it's actually getting ready to, to roll out, it's like, oh, well, you've already bought into it. And then when we talk about the money follows the student, yeah, one way, it's not a 360 follow. It goes one way and then it stays there. And then now you have a student back somewhere where they started or at a different school, but they can get the funding to go back. Um, so yeah no it's, it's a lot of conversations that are being um cut out when we're talking about it in a you know in a whole they just take the, the box off with the with the wrapper and then they look inside and then there's this whole ugly box inside thank you for talking about that i'm not sure that uh, when it comes to this conversation that race is front and center and what that looks like for communities of color and I appreciate you bringing that perspective in because it's much, it's needed because you are right about how it is gift wrapped to certain people for buy-in, but it doesn't work the same for all people, right? So thank you. I, I really appreciate that perspective. Uh, Vicki, I want to come to you for a minute. Um, you have a very interesting and wonderful background. Um, do, you, do vouchers actually provide better outcomes for students in your opinion? Um, I know you have experience both in the private sector and also the public sector. So if you could just talk about that for a minute. Um, when it comes to looking at educational programs, we really have to look at the data. Um, the data is what proves that voucher programs do not improve student outcomes. There is literally no data that proves that they, that they do that. In fact, voucher pro the voucher program in D.C. caused so much damage to students that they determined that it was equivalent of missing 68 days of school, which is really, really, it's a huge loss for the students. And voucher the vouchers also um, specifically hurt certain demographics of students. Akiko touched on that in her last one, in her last answer. but. So although voucher proponents say they want all students to have better choices, vouchers generally only cover a percentage of education, like Akika was mentioning. Um, so that means that voucher programs exclude the fa those families that don't have the money to cover the whole tuition amount, as they've documented that in many private schools, you don't have the system set up to support certain groups of students. Students who are academically behind, English language learners, special education students, or even students with um, specific behavior challenges. And since the students whose families are actively seeking other options often are facing these challenges, it's a huge disservice to them. Thank you so much, Vicki. Um, also, I, the, I agree with you as well, and those are staggering numbers. Uh, what provides the best outcomes for students in public schools and how do, it, how do we work towards that? Is there certain stuff that, that can be done to increase those statistics and make our schools better? Well, I, I'm going to start by saying that the failures in public education are complex issue. There's no easy solutions. What we need to identify and address what can be fixed in our system. We know that Nevada public 
is critically underfunded. I think that's agreed on across the board. And with our overcrowded classrooms and critical teacher shortage, funding must be addressed first. In addition, we need to also address school cultures and address school sites with dysfunction that's hurting our students. Teachers can tell you within school buildings just in Clark County, here there are some crazy things that are happening that educators and students have to deal with every day. We know students do better with stability in the classroom. That's why we really need to work on teacher retention. We want to keep our good licensed educators in the state of Nevada and in those classrooms because the revolving door of educators do not help our students and they definitely don't help student outcomes. And one way you can keep our licensed educators by, is by improving K, uh, pay and benefits. As Assemblywoman Torres was mentioning, it's not just pay, it's also benefits. Teachers' health trust has been a huge problem here in Clark County. Remember, your educators are preparing the leaders of, for the future of the state of Nevada. It's time that Nevada prioritizes public education. Campaigns like NFD's Type for 20 are already working to raise educator salaries, reduce class sizes, and improve our public school systems. We need to all work together to have a public education system that puts our children on a path to a bright future. Because ultimately, school privatizers have an interest in making sure public schools are under-resourced and underperforming to make the ground more fertile for their organizing for school choice. Thank you so much for that, Vicki. Next, I want to go to former Clark County Trustee Danielle Ford. Um, former Trustee, parents do want choices. As we've talked about, you've heard all of our speakers so far. What can parents do to increase? This question was worded with the word power, but I want to see their agency within their child's education. Sure. Um, I would encourage parents to remember that uh, the school board and the school district works for them. They are the consumer. Um, they don't answer to, to us, you know, we should be answering to the community. I would encourage parents to first start by talking to their trustees and letting them know what they want, you know, what kind of choices do they want. And uh, like it's been, it's been talked about a bunch of times, we know that parents do want school choice. They maybe don't want what's been branded as school choice, but they want choices for schools. Um, and they want them within the public education space. Parents are not going, man, I wish I could send my kids to somewhere a private school. They're going, I have some choices, right? So some of the things are like more magnet programs. Magnet programs come with uh, federal funding. So when it does become a uh, you know, struggle for one family to get their kids to school, funding for transportation will come with that. Uh, magnet programs come with specific you know, CPE programs, real world vocational training that parents want. Um, parents want, you know, we, and we learned from COVID-19 that a lot of families, maybe not all, but many were successful with real-time distance learning options all year long, uh, even with the chronic absenteeism that we see uh, with kids that struggle to get to school. If there was always, uh, you know, some sort of distance learning option that kept their kids in the zone school and not have to go to somewhere like Nevada Learning Academy, uh, that's another option. Um, they want different start and end times. You know, they one thing that a lot of parents want that even uh, our experts have said would help with class sizes is dual schedules, especially in Las Vegas, which is a shift working town. Having dual schedules with a you know in some areas or different schools where class si uh, classes start at two or three o'clock. Uh, we even have daycare centers that go 24 hours a day. Okay, and we could provide education you know, in the evening too, if we, if we needed to. More recess, more art, music, uh, physical education, and less standardized testing. These are things that parents want and reasons. All of these reasons are why parents are leaving public school. Uh, these are the things that I've heard. And I've seen a lot of um, parents, you know, say, oh, this private school, this charter school is gonna offer that. So why are we not responding with, okay, how can we offer this for these parents as well? Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. I, I love hearing your perspective as well. It's, it's very unique. Uh, what, what solutions do you see to the push-pull between public schools and charter schools? Because they have to coexist, right? 
and and that's an important part of this conversation is that it, it shouldn't just be one or the other which i'm sure all of you would agree with so what what solutions do you see to that push pull that we're kind of seeing with these campaigns <laughs> to promote vouchers or other forms of uh, programs like that sure um you know public Public schools and charter schools and private schools uh, could all coexist better with more accountability. Um, charters were intended to be a different choice for some families um, as a way to test new ways of doing education. And they were originally started by educators who were like, hey, I think this would work for kids. Can we try it out without implementing it into the entire district and being wrong or something? So then you'd have some families go like, you know what, I'm going to let my kids be a skinny pig kind of essentially for this. Uh, that's the choice, right? Um, what happened is that it's a big business and a lot of charters, not all, I'll say, but a lot of charters, um, their intent is really to be a plan B for public schools. And so instead of um, being, you know, an asset to help get data and to help uh, the entire community they've become competition between the that school and the closest local zone school and um you know we should be using them we should be working together and testing new methods to improve education for everybody unfortunately i don't really see that happening and finally for you former trustee uh, you touched on this briefly, and then I think we're going to get to some audience questions uh, for the panel. Uh, what role does the school board play in advocating for students and parents in the face of pressure from private or charter schools? So the public school board exists. It was created um, to protect public education from changing political administrations at the state and the federal level. Um, the founding fathers thought through it and said, you know, we got to protect public education, it needs to be nonpartisan, it needs to not have uh, these political agendas tied to it. The board of public school districts are supposed to be pro public education. Even if you teach at a charter, even if your kid goes to a private school, you are there to protect public money and provide public education for all students, not the students that are in charter schools, not the students that are in private schools. Doesn't mean that the other ones are bad. There are boards for there's a charter authority board. There's every, you know, public or I'm sorry, private school has like its own board. We should be working with them. We should be communicating with them. We should, but we should not be trying to cause, you know, charters and private schools to thrive. Uh, any trustee that's publicly elected should have the best intent for the public education system with the product being a society that is educated and mentally healthy. Um, not individual students. So, um, you know, if public school trustees are not, so if you go and you talk to your public school trustees, you say, these are the things that I want, these are the choices I want, and they ignore you, or you watch the board meetings and you see that they are not trying to implement things that the community wants, and you see that um, they're voting to funnel money to charter schools, or you see that they are not publicly advocating against vouchers then they're probably not actually there to support public education. And that um, opens a bigger conversation around privatization and uh, what I believe is a national privatization agenda to support charters and private schools and essentially cripple the public education system so that education management companies can uh, funnel portions of taxpayer dollars right into their greedy little bank accounts. So that's all I have for that answer. Thank you so much for that, former trustee. Uh, I appreciate your perspective. Uh, so next, uh, I'd like to get to some audience questions because we have just a few minutes left. Uh, first up, we have from Anonymous, and I think I would like Assembly Member Anderson to take this. What other names are used for vouchers? No, uh, excellent question. Let me do my best. Uh, you have. Um, sometimes they're called education savings accounts or ESAs. Sometimes they are called um, opportunity scholarships. Um, sometimes, oh man, I feel like I'm playing like Family Feud right now. Uh, what would be another one? Um, so you've got the actual vouchers. Rarely are they actually called vouchers. Um, 
Opportunity Scholarship seems to be the largest one, I believe. I'm going to phone a friend, let's just bring in another game show and see if Assembly Member Torres can think of any others that she's had to deal with as well. Uh, so she has one more year in the legislature than I do. Can you think of any others? Uh, just Opportunity Scholarship CSAs are really the big ones and vouchers. Yeah. Thank you both for that. Yeah, we've heard different names for them for sure. Um, and this actually touches on that a little bit. I think we have time. Um, how did we land on opportunity scholarships to hide the voucher scheme here in Nevada? Assembly member Torres, why don't you take that one for us? So I wasn't in the legislature the session that the opportunity scholarship started. I want to say that they started maybe in 2017 um, or 2015. Uh, uh, Anyways, the, the opportunity scholarships, I think, was kind of like a negotiation to allow for um, essentially some vouchers to be available. Um, and there was, a, I believe it was funded through the modified business tax. Um, and it's only available to certain students and only available to students um, from low income backgrounds. So they have to meet like the poverty threshold. Um, so opportunity scholarships, I think, was kind of like the negotiation to meet a very select um, population. Uh, and it has continued to maintain funding. There are issues with just like removing this funding completely because you have so many people that have become completely like they go to these schools now and that's where their student goes. And if you take away the funding now, that's uh, and oftentimes they are students with disabilities as well. Um, and then you have that student having to relocate and change schools um, becomes an issue. So I think uh, for right now, the opportunity scholarships, uh, they've just been maintained, but no additional funding has been added. Um, so it hasn't allowed for new recipients of that scholarship. Thank you. That was a, a good explanation of it, actually. Uh, so one second. There we go. Okay. Um, and the next question, um, I don't know, former trustee Ford, I think I would like you to take this one. Where is the accountability of policymakers in supplying education funding or one of the um, legislators that we have on today. Um, somebody's asking about that. I guess I don't fully understand the question. Sorry, it, it says, where is the accountability of policymakers in supplying education funding? Nevada per pupil funding oh. currently ranks 48th in the nation. I'll get my, my comments on that. Um, you know, Vicki uh, Cridell mentioned that we need more funding. Like, that's true. But um, I will say is having experience of seeing what we're spending money on. Um, we need more accountability for the district. I'm going to say CCSD specifically, and then of course all districts. But um, I actually would not even feel comfortable asking for more money, knowing that we are not being super fiscal with it, fiscally responsible. Um, I think that the trustees should absolutely have more accountability. They should have, um, you know, trustees get a lot of training, but it's like like scattered and it's like anything they want training on just as long as they can check the box that they got that credit they don't necessarily get actual training on the fiduciary duties to be good public stewards to understand constitutionally what they're supposed to be doing who they serve who they work for we they, we didn't get any training like that sure we got a lot of money on what the budget look, looks like and how to read it and how to you know sit in a meeting and be professional and things like that but we didn't get any actual training on how to be uh, really provide great oversight um, and how to communicate with legislators so that we're on the same page knowing that hey we're doing the best to spend the money um, i don't think that the trustees or the superintendent or his staff are even trying to save money um, and i think that there should be a lot of accountability with the trustees because they're the ones that took an oath to protect the public and protect uh, public money. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in, but that's where the accountability should be. Oh, I, I appreciate what Trustee Ford, or former Trustee Ford, has to say with that. I think that's one reason why um, our interim uh, Ways and Means Committee, I believe, or IFC, has has put forward a bill for for a Clark County School District audit of the finances that will be coming forward, as for that very reason, um, just is the money being used as it should be. When it comes to the charter school world, it depends upon who holds that charter. Is it a public or is it a private charter? Because some of our schools um, are actually, the charters are actually held by the school district 
some of them are held by the state. And so there's a whole bunch of different ways to also look at that, that funding. But I do think the, the issues that uh, Trustee Ford just brought up are 100% why um, our internal, our interim finance committee made the decision to bring forward a bill to have that on it. And I didn't I know if Assemblymember Torres wanted to add more to that as well. Can I jump in really, really quick and just give a little bit of insight that might help your answer? Um, so kind of to put it back on the state a little bit, um, as a trustee, when I was clerk in 2020, I think it was 2020, um, and the clerk has to sign all the things that we approve and everything. Well, there was money and there still is, continues to be money that's donated to the district and it's given by private donors and to the tune of millions and millions of dollars. Specifically, this one that I'm gonna bring up was for um, uh, MAPS assessment to continue during COVID time. Well, the trustees do not even know who that is. Okay, so uh, I was trying to ask, it's on the record, you know, put it on the record, all those things. There, so there are things where the trustees don't even have the ability to know this information. And that's where we need to work together and we might need some stronger bills passed that ensures that the trustees who are elected by the people do are privy to that information, even if so the loophole they did here was that, yeah, Trustee Ford, you ha you have a right to see all the money that comes into CCSD. However, this private donor is giving $3.2 million directly to uh, the Northwestern Education Association to continue MAPS testing and paying directly to them. It is not hitting CCSD's budget. And I'm like, okay, well, that's great. Our staff does not have masks or PPE and they're handing out food to families. So maybe if somebody wants to donate $3.2 million, we might decide with a better use of that money. However, it's not in my control because there's some reason why they can just hand it over to a private company, keep business as usual going, keep assessment going, and ensure that that's not something that the trustees decide to cut when we're trying to be fiscally responsible. So that's where we got to work together and figure out that little loophole. Wow, I'm, I'm floored. Uh, I am, thank you, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Assembly Member Torres, would you like a final word on this part of the conversation? You know, I just think it's important to note too that if we're gonna, you know, have a conversation about putting more funding in education, um, the consistent funding in education too, we have to look at like how we're going to actually fund that. And so we as a community, I think, um, have the responsibility to consider, like it's not just about more money. We don't have a state income tax. Like there's no magic money tree. We always talk about the money tree outside of the Capitol building, but there is no magic money tree that we can just shake and make more money appear. Like the money is what it is. Uh, and so I think that we have to have a very serious conversation about how you increase that revenue. Absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I want to thank all of our, our panelists today. I think this has been a really enlightening conversation and I think it has also um, really shut, I don't know, it's it shed a light for me on sort of the intricacies of this issue and how we need to work together to overcome it. Um, I think we are out of time um but i will ask really quickly akiko do you have any final thoughts uh oh no <laughs> um i i think this was amazing i think more conversations need to happen definitely at the community level um you know i'm always willing to to make those spaces and be a part of making that space happen um because we really need to get to the grassroots level and talk to the people, um, like really, literally. Um, Danielle, fire as always. <laughs> Vicki, I love you so much. Um, thank you. Um, I am, you know, very happy to be in space with educators. I'm an educator that not, I'm a non-educator that, that it has been often thrust into spaces with educators, um, and I appreciate that because it, it is helping me. Um, build relationships and get to understand things from the educator level so that when I am in the community and I am talking to the community members, um, I'm connecting the dots or trying to connect the dots for the two because you guys are robots, right? You're people. Um, and I'd like to see that you are saw that way, like people's like, hey, yeah, they're not robots. They're actually people, you know, with lives and stuff. And they, this is a service job. You are taking care of our children. So 
Um, thank you again, Battleborn Progress, for having this summit. And I'm willing always to talk to everyone and get into the roots of everything. All right, everyone. Thank you for this amazing panel. I appreciate every single one of you. Uh, thank you for being my dear friends and working on this issue. I know we could go literally all day on the issue of education as a child of an educator in the Clark County School District. I know how important this issue is. And uh, as somebody who went through the Clark County School District, I understand that there are incredible challenges that we still have to meet for our teachers and our young people all across the state. So thank you to each and every one of you. We are gonna take a quick break, everyone, and we will be back with our Battleborn Progress team, some of the members of our team, to just do some hot takes and answer some questions before we go to the next panel. So bring us all your good questions. Our team is gonna be back with you in a few minutes. We're gonna take about a five minute break and be back with you in a few. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 